Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, technology. and particularly the bits in between. And welcome to this episode. I've mentioned previously that one of the advantages of doing this podcast is I get to learn about aspects of human factors from experts in their field, potentially bits that I've not really got much knowledge on. Um, Another advantage is that it's a fantastic excuse to catch up with people and friends who I've worked with and haven't seen in a long time. Today is really cool because I get to do both of them things in one interview, so I'm really quite excited. But well, before we get into that, uh, just a quick reminder that the Chad Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors Annual Conference is coming up at the end of April, so EHF 2023. The full program has been released. If you go and look on the website, then um, you'll be able to see all the different ty- um, the, the different sessions we've got going, the, um, the posters, the, the type of um, things that we're going to be hearing about. And it's a fantastic lineup of speakers. So there is still time to get your tickets and come along and join us for a few days of knowledge sharing and being able to ask questions of experts but actually probably one of the more important bits is some great networking and some time spent in the bar. But let's get back to today. Uh, We're going to be talking about naturalistic decision-making with Rob Hutton. I first got to know Rob when we both worked at BA Systems at the Advanced Technology Centre in in Bristol, and it's fantastic to have him back with us um, here today. So, Rob, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for taking the time to come and join us. Thanks for having me, Barry. It's good to see you after quite a a while. (laughs) It is. It's been it's it's been a minute, hasn't it? Um, so, to, just for everybody else's benefit, um, let's start with what you're doing now. What what is your current role, and what are you doing on a day to day basis? Yeah. So, at the moment, I'm at. Uh, I just started a position at University of West of England uh, in the psychology department. So, I'm a lecturer in occupational and business psychology. Um, I started last August, so this is um, sort of coming towards the end of the of my first year there, really. Um, and so that's my sort of main main role. Um, but I also managed to con- continue to do some consultancy work um, uh, in my extra day uh, uh, a week, um, which involves a variety of things. Um, including some things that come off the back of my involvement with the um, the NDM Association and um, Cognitive Task Analysis Institute, um, which was set up uh, during kind of COVID times. Um, and then that's led to kind of some some mentoring and support to projects that that utilize cognitive task analysis and so forth. So, so that's quite good in terms of keeping my hand in, in terms of external consultancy um, and a little bit of research as well. And you still have chance to have weekends and, and time away as well. That's an awful lot to cram into um, <laughs> a, a like five to seven days a week. Yeah, well, so my uni role is four days a week. So, mm-hmm. um, so my Fridays, um, which is flexible, obviously, but I kind of kept that um, prior to um, going to UE, I was um, I, I split my time between uh, Nottingham Trent University, which is where I did started my first um, my first uh, role in higher education, and I was working at the time with uh, former colleagues from BAE, um, Andy Leggett and, and uh, Hannah Blackford, um, in our company uh, Trimetis, which continues to to be successful. Um, but I'm no longer involved with that. But um, so I've 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 tried to to keep some time available to do that kind of thing, um, in part because I think it's important to be doing applied work alongside the um, the academic stuff, um, and and also it's it's interesting and fun as well. So I, I'm uh, one of the other things that I do is with the World Health Organization doing some leadership um, leadership development uh, uh, training program particularly the decision-making aspect of it. So most of the things that I do tie together with respect to the kind of cognitive aspects of work and decision-making, which is kind of what we're talking about today. Yeah, that's cool. So if I can take you back to the beginning, why did you get involved in sort of like that human factors, this sort of psychology to begin with? What what was the driver? (laughs) Yeah, um, I, so I did a psychology degree, um, and I think with, uh, similar to a lot of psych- psychology um, undergraduates, didn't really know what I wanted to do. I certainly was not interested in clinical um, psych. Um, uh, that was not my path. I knew that. I was more interested in sort of human performance and um, 
I mean, I part of it as thinking back about it is is, is an interest in human performance, teamwork. Uh, I was sporty, so I loved doing the sports stuff. I did all the D of E and and um, army cadets and all of that stuff. So I was interested in how teams work together and work together well and perform well together. Um, and in my psychology degree, um, I I was lucky actually. So I did my undergraduate in Swansea, and there was a guy get there called Dave Oborn who wrote um, a couple of introductory uh, textbooks on ergonomics and what in the day was called behavioral computing. Mm -hmm. uh, my first sort of foray into trying to get my head around computers. So this was mid 80s before desktops and, and what have you. Um, and so I was really interested in that because it was applied. It was applying the psychology in in um, in you know real applications mm -hmm. as opposed to a lot of the abstract theory and stuff that I was learning in my undergraduate. Um, I, I it didn't quite hook me enough at the time to go straight into that. Um, it took me a couple of years to realize what my path was going to be. Uh, and when I was looking at programs to do a postgraduate degree, which I realized I had to do, um, the options were sort of relatively limited. It was it was kind of Loughborough, uh, Birmingham and London. Um, Loughborough was my hometown, so I didn't want to go back there. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not a big city guy. So Birmingham and London were definitely not um, were, were really not good options. Um, and I had a mate who'd gone to the States and he told me, um, yeah, I'm doing a, a master's degree and it's all paid for by the university. I've got a research assistantship. So I was like, OK, I could I could do that then. And I also still had itchy feet a little bit after my undergrad. Yeah. So, I, so I, I went to the States um, and I did a, um, uh, a master's in but what at the time was called applied behavioral science. Um, but it looked like there was some interesting stuff going on there. Um, I applied to a few programs. Um, one person contacted me and actually sent me an envelope full of his papers that he'd written, um, John Flack, who ended up being my supervisor um, when I went to Wright State, um, who was very heavily influential in my sort of subsequent um, way that I think about human performance in complex systems. Um, and, and that was, that was it really. I was hooked. I did, um, I spent two years doing my master's at Wright State. Um, we, Wright State was right next to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is the home of the U.S. Air Force, um, Human Engineering Directorate or whatever it was called at the time. Um, so there's some really cool Air Force stuff going on with simulators and, um, experiments in sort of advanced cockpits. And, um, I was kind of drawn to to Wright State partly because of the aviation link. My dad was a, was a pilot, so I kind of had that as a kind of in the back of my head as, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. Um, yeah, and then it grew from there, really. That's really cool. So you've been, basically, it feels like you almost like um, kept it warm and then you just had like almost like bursts of inspiration right at the... Uh, right yeah. The yeah, it was never a dream job. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of students don't, you know, uh, it's easy to say everybody you know to think everybody's like you isn't it that's that's one of the fallacies so um i yeah i didn't i didn't really know what direction i wanted to go in i was kind of looking for a hook and um you know even when i finished my undergraduate degree i was still looking at um potentially all of the the classics at the time like going into policing or yeah. what were the other options educational psych i think i applied for a pgce at one point in that kind of two year gap um but then i thought actually no i really i really like the the um the the ergonomic stuff and so i was from loughborough so i always and my mum actually participated in the in the day um loughborough had the uh, human sciences um an advanced technology group, HUSAT, and then a group called um, the Institute of Consumer Ergonomics, ICE. And my mum had done a study. Um, they were looking at shopping trolley, design of shopping trolleys. Right. And my mum had participated in this study. And so I I knew about ergonomics from sort of, you know, before it was a, a, a popular term, I suppose. And so in the back of my head, all of these things were just kind of bubbling away. And then, yeah, the, the opportunity to go to the US and do, um, and, and sort of, I guess just decide. Yeah, you know, that was that was the commitment. Really, I'd made a commitment at that point that at least for the next few years I was gonna I was gonna go for it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it wasn't a it wasn't an easy decision actually because with a psychology background, 
um, as I was looking at programs in the US, they were split between engineering and psych. So I, I looked at the human factors um, at the time. It was the Human Factors Society list of graduate programs. Um, and half of them I couldn't apply for because I didn't have an engineering background and they, they were all geared towards professional engineering qualifications. So that limited me to the psychology uh, programs. Um, but even then I was thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I'm really going to be out of my comfort zone here. I, 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 I got my worst grades in Dave Oborn's classes because <laughs> I kind of thought I got it um, yeah. as an undergraduate and I focused my efforts on, on other things that I wasn't so good at. So I didn't do very well in those. And the things I struggled with was, were sort of uh, visual perception and, and cognition, which have ended up being the, the direction that I, that I went into. So I was really, it was a bit of a punt. Um, and, uh, but, you know, sometimes the things work in your favor and and it just mm. i absolutely landed on my feet with with john uh with right state uh and then ultimately with my link to um gary klein and klein associates and, and the ndm stuff i mean that was my that was my that was my career path set pretty much at that point so we talked about your career path then so you've um you've done your your piece in the states um, or you've done your education piece in the, in the States. Where did you go from there? Um, what, what was the progression to where you're at now? Yeah, so slightly driven by visa requirements, I decided to, um, I applied for the, um, uh, our program that had been applied behavioral science became human factors and industrial organizational psychology. So it actually combined HF and o what we call occupational psychology. Um, whilst I was there, they, they got a, a PhD program approved by the state. Um, so I applied to do the PhD program uh, there um, in order to keep my visa uh, valid while I looked for, for work opportunities. So I've always um, kind of been driven by um, work problems rather than kind of thinking up what I thought might be interested. I've, I've, I've kind of been drawn towards other people's trying to help other, other solve other people's problems, I suppose. So I was looking for, I wasn't quite sure what a PhD topic might be. So I was really looking for work experience to try and see, you know, how to apply this in the real world. Um, I, as part of my continuing PhD work, um, Gary, uh, Gary Klein came along to, uh, to do a course, uh, a summer course, uh, a summer a module for the summer um, on cognitive task analysis. And uh, and I did that with a few colleagues um, in the uh, in the graduate program, and the, sort of a there was there was a bit of a um, a light bulb moment there where learning about even in my master's degree doing human factors it was still quite theoretical a lot of models and theories and you know with a kind of a nod towards application but. Um, uh, the, the methods that we were using were still experiment. I was learning experimental methods. Uh, and then suddenly uh, I was introduced to this world of actually talking to people doing hard, you know, complex jobs yeah. and trying to get in kind of inside their heads around, you know, how are they, what, what does expertise, what does skilled performance look like? Um, and, and then finding out about that, how do we then turn that around into interventions of various kinds? And so the idea of sort of these cognitive task analysis methods um, was quite new. And I suddenly realized, oh, actually, I can do, you know, I can actually, I'm actually useful. I'm not just, uh, yeah, right. I'm not just got all this knowledge, abstract knowledge in my head. I can actually do stuff and apply it. Um, and, uh, and so I got caught by that. And then um, I sort of cheekily wrote to or asked Gary if he had any jobs available in his company which was quite um not very big at the time and they said actually we've got a, a bunch of pro projects come in that we need people for come along and have an interview um and that was the beginning of my uh, I had 14 years with Klein Associates right um and when I started there was about 15 people there probably about eight or nine um mostly psychologists people with psych backgrounds um, of various different kinds, uh, and, if, and obviously the support people, about, about 15 people. And then whilst, whilst I was at Klein Associates, it grew to over 30, 35 before being right. bought out. But that was the beginning. Yeah, that was the link into real world stuff. And so having spent um, a good number of years there, what, what dragged you back to the UK? Uh, yeah, partly personal stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, my family has always been here. Um, I uh, 
it, it's a tough decision being you know living away from home away from your family you, you have to make a decision about whether you commit to that or not I committed to it for I was at Klein Associates like I said for 14 years it was my life it was my home um, before I came back to the UK I had been looking for a while at different job options um, and uh, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, to the point where I didn't know if I was going to be able to make it work in, in the UK. I actually became a US citizen yeah. uh, in the January of the year that I moved back to the UK because I knew that my green card, if I came back to the UK, I'd need to give it a good couple of years or more to see if it was going to work. And by that time, my green card would have run out. And if I wanted to then go back to the US that I, where I knew you know that I could I could work. Um, it was all going to be too difficult, so I became a citizen, and then and then promptly moved back to the UK. Um, so uh, yeah, and and in the meantime, there was some PhD study that didn't go quite in my it didn't go quite right. Um, so uh, I I'd been struggling trying to finish up a PhD, and that had um, that had not worked out for 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 various reasons. Um, uh, a lot of them around sort of my own kind of headspace at the time. So I was kind of looking to make a transition, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, so there was, yeah, it was, a, it was a quite a difficult, quite a challenging time, actually. Um, so I looked back to the UK. Um, I I realised I applied for three jobs, all of which were in the southwest. So right. I realised that my destiny was in, in or around Bristol. <laughs> Um, I got an offer from uh, Laird and the BAE um, Human Factors Capability Crowd, mm -hmm. um, and I, and I decided that that was. I mean, I knew about um, Sowerby Research Centre and Filton and the you know all of the, the sort of the history in in the human factors and ergonomics stuff that they'd been doing, and I thought that was going to be a good fit. Um, and it wasn't that far away from me being doing work with with. Um, uh in the us where i was doing a lot of dod stuff not very much air force stuff more um probably navy and, and army stuff but still kind of in defense so yeah, yeah i knew that i was gonna i was, i knew that was going to be a good place for me with some with some good people cool so you then went on to and obviously that's where uh where i met you when you came and joined uh joined yeah. Salby. um then we had the I guess the, the unfortunate piece when Salby decided to uh um with boots um <laughs> So then you decided to be decided to be um, form a consultancy. Yeah, we um, there was so obviously you know human factors is broad. Uh, we think we're specialists, but even within human factors, there's a lot of diversity. Um, and so there was a few people that um, I think you had. I think you had gone by. Yes, I gone I, by. I, yeah, you started K Sharp by then. So um, a year earlier. I think. Yeah, and so um, myself. Um, I mean, BAU made us redundant, um, and part of that was to trying to, if you know, help us look for places elsewhere in BAE systems. And so some people went to other parts of the business. Um, I mean, everybody, everybody in that group, there's probably almost 30 people. Um, everybody ended up landing on their feet because they were all good people mm. um, and very capable. And um, and that, and I think the only, I think there was um, myself and uh, Andy Leggett and and hannah blackford who were all interested in at the time um military command and control stuff that was our in, that was our interest and from a decision you know the decision making planning cognitive aspects of work that was my interest so we said well you know we were already doing work for the mod through the various um framework agreements um hfi dtc uh, the, the Defence Human Capability Science Technology Centre stuff. So we knew we could, there was interesting good work that we could be doing. So we just thought, well, let's just do it, give it a go on our own. We started Trimetis uh, as the three of us. Um, uh, and then we just, we managed to, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a niche really for people interested in cognitive work, particularly in the command and control space within defence. So that was, that was sort of most of our work, but then also managed to do a few other things um, around the edges that were made partly in healthcare. Um, uh, we did some, um, yeah, healthcare, uh, international labor. I did some stuff for the International Labour Organization um, with the UN around knowledge management. So there was some interesting stuff going on. And obviously, as you know, in a small business, you have there's a certain amount of freedom to choose what you do um but then there is the kind of the bills to pay so um yeah so that was so that was trimetis um 
I think we started 2015, so they're now over eight years old. I I left in 21, so I was there for six years, um, and we we formed a good solid foundation. Um, we we added a couple of people. I think there's two or three people, new people there now um, since I left. So yeah, so that's going great guns. Um, but I had always wanted to, in my career plan, I've always had a link with academia so there's always for me there's this this huge challenge of of um sort of uh science and practice and you know what what goes in on academia and, and what happens in in consultancy and applied work and i've always tried to keep a feet a foot in both camps to a certain extent so even when i was at um at klein associates at bae at trimetis i was i i picked up a few teaching uh lecturing kinds of uh, things um, to to keep doing that, and also the links with um, in terms of pulling good teams together to do project work. I yeah. it was always important that we had good, strong academic um, teammates as well as the the sort of the applied side of things to bring that together. So that had always been important. But I had wanted to give it a go in the uh, sort of lecturing, in part because um, I don't think there's enough people um talking about human factors opportunities in psychology departments and i wanted to be be able to contribute to that so while i was at trimetis um nottingham trent um were advertising for some roles from applied psychologists little did i know that they they when they said applied psychologists they meant sort of forensic and you know right. and um, clinical and you know human factors was still kind of a, a minority sport at that point um but i got a job i got a, a, a role with them part-time uh, with NTU and part time with Trimetis, um, and then and then over the next sort of two or three years, I, I realised actually I wanted to give it a bit a bit more of a more of my effort towards that, and the opportunity at UE came up, so that's how I ended up. Um, so I applied for the role at UE um, in the occupational and business psychology area. Um, again, it's not it's not sort of human factors and ergonomics, but um, you know I think there is there are there's a there's a lack of there's a there's a lack of u university um you know educational opportunities i think for hf uh, e uh, you know early career people um so yeah so my mission at the moment is kind of to to try and, and change that at least within the uh, the ue psychology department that's fantastic because i think you're absolutely right up and down the uk there isn't enough early uh, promotion of of hf you know you people so many people just accidentally stumble upon it oh that that's cool i want to do some of that um and we, i think there is a lot of work or there is a drive for a lot of work to try and get some more of this early stuff so i think um more power to your elbow in in, in promoting that that sort of stuff yeah yeah i think you're right i think um and, and that's we need those other we need people from a, you know obviously it's multidisciplinary mm. um and it's operate and it's and it's fixing you know it's doing stuff and so we need people from other disciplines so you know the engineering disciplines compute you know computer science where what have you the people that come in from the other side so the operational side and they've picked up a little bit of you know whether it's on the sort of training side or or the engineering side of things they've picked it up as part of their job and then they've and then they've retrained or you know they've done a, a degree uh, a postgraduate degree later in life but even the postgraduate degree options are quite limited as well so um yeah there's there's definitely a place for all of those people in in the field um but i think there's we also need the psychologists who are sort of pushing the the psychological science alongside the technology advances to keep you know to keep because we don't have all of the answers in psychology still that that's yeah. what sort of drew me to it is i i thought i could contribute to it because we we haven't figured it all out yet so cool well we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to get into one of the holes that you're trying to fill so we'll be right Excellent. back Excellent. You are listening to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. We wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for your support. You can help further by rating us through your podcast provider, sharing us through social media, and telling your friends and colleagues. Let's work together in raising awareness of the value in putting users at the center of what we do. And welcome back. Today we're talking to Rob Hutton and about to get into naturalistic decision making. So, Rob, from the top, really, what is naturalistic decision making? Why do I need to care about it? Uh, yeah. So, um, 
it's natural history decision making probably um, got its start kind of in the mid 80s quite quietly, I think, with some research um, looking at decision making. Um, the early work was funded by the US Army. So this is my this is my 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 biased view of, of the world. Right. So this is my story. Uh, this is my version of it. Um, the US Army w was trying to understand um, why the models that they were seeing in psychology weren't mapping onto how their military their, their military commanders were making you know reasonable decisions under all of this time pressure and uncertainty mm -hmm. and so um they uh, so gary klein plays a key part in this in this story one of if not the sort of pioneer certainly one of the early pioneers in this area um took on the project with his his small um business which i think might have only been him and one other person at the time no not one other a couple of other people mm -hmm. um they couldn't go and they couldn't go and talk to they were they were sort of they recognized the limitations of the models that have come out of lab studies in psychology with students um so they wanted to go out and see how real people made real decisions under time pressure and uncertainty and they thought firefighters might be a good starting point so they went out um they they got some funding from the u.s army they they went out on on shouts with the local fire department both urban and um uh sort of more rural suburban firefighter departments they 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 were asked and they were asking them at the time they were asking them you know tell us about the options that you come up with to make your decisions because that's what psychology was telling us it's all you know decision making is all about choices between courses of action and the firefighters were saying well we we don't really we don't really come up with options in fact we don't really make decisions and so this peaked um gary and the team's interest and the, and so they started to kind of un try to unpack um how are these people making decisions how are they using their knowledge and experience to make um satisfactory decisions in in circumstances that where there wasn't an optimal or best solution so it was kind of um we now talk about it sort of muddling muddling through getting the job done um, with the information that's available and the time that's available um and so that turned into um a model of decision making which was quite different from the sort of rational perspectives on the, the classical decision models of rationality and trying to find the best choice um the rpd model recognition prime decision model was born um people kept, became really interested in that because it seemed to resonate with them and, and how they saw other people and how they were making decisions themselves. And th they, they saw there was something to that that was that added something to our understanding of how people make decisions. So um, there was other work going on um, in the human factors area, actually. I think that psychology has progressed, um, uh, has been pushed by human factors and applied problems in, in a, a, a number of different ways. I mean, Micah Ensley and the situation awareness stuff was 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 being born at the, around the same time. Um, there was a conference in late 19, uh, kind of 89, I think was the first NDM, it was called NDM, naturalistic decision making. And so the focus was, was on decision making at the time. And the naturalistic part was we were using methods that were uh, sort of naturalistic inquiry methods, which tended to be uh, observation, um, interviews, um, and, and other forms of ethnographic kind of field research methods which were very different from the experimental stuff that the psychologists were doing and and coming up with these models that didn't seem to scratch the itch in terms of you know how are these people in real situations dealing with all of the stuff in the you know the, the uncertain time pressure and uncertainty and all of the other things so i think probably that that conference was the beginning of of ndm um that conference became a biannual conference so uh, another one in 91 93 so it started to and um i think one of the, one of the key elements of the conference was that it wasn't just research it was researchers it was sponsors and operational pre people with real operational problems and so it was very focused on um understanding um decision making in real world environment in you know in, in real contexts with people who brought experience and sometimes expertise so that another thread to the ndm area is is, uh, is uh, research that's been done in on skilled performance and expertise and what does that look like um quite often we hold that up as the sort of the gold standard for performance okay um and part of the another i guess another part of the ndm um 
approach is the idea that um, in a lot of complex, you know, so maybe in the last 10 or 15 years, maybe a little bit longer, we've started to talk about complexity and the challenges of complexity in, in work. And, and one of the, the reasons that NDM, I think, has been so um, important and to a degree, I guess, successful in terms of unpacking some of this stuff is that you need, in these complex environments, there, things are unpredictable and they you can't use statistical models probabilistic models um we can't use sort of classic formal logic we have to use other logics you know um other, other sort of uh, because there are no there are no optimal solutions we have to just move things forward progress the situation in a reasonable way that doesn't make things worse but hopefully makes things better um and satisfy so that's a kind of a key part of the the uh, the RPD model is that the goal is to satisfy, not optimize. Um, and so in these complex environments, these kinds of models have become more and more um, important. Um, the NDM uh, community has grown. So I think a lot of people, so in about mid 90s, um, there were so many people interested in this area within within the US, within the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society. They started a technical group, mm -hmm. which was called the Cognitive Engineering and Decision Making Technical Group, CEDM. Right. CEDM got its own journal around 96, the jo Journal of Cognitive Engineering and Decision Making. So suddenly we have this uh, sort of um, focal point for professionals, um, particularly in, in the US. Um, and... Uh, and the other thing that was going on was, as uh, talk a little bit more about the R RPD model, maybe the recognition prime decision model. But RPD model is not really just a model of decision making; it's a model of cognitive performance. And the other part of of, the, of NDM is that it's it's gone beyond just um, looking at certainly gone beyond looking at decision making as a choice between courses of action, but also bringing in things like how do people assess situations and make sense of them. Um, so that starts to bring in some of the stuff that Micah, so Micah kind of affiliate, Micah Ensley affiliates with with NDM, with the situation awareness stuff, because that kind of ties in. Um, but then we started talking about things like sense making and, and um, analytical tasks, which are very cognitive. They're not necessarily about making decisions for courses of action, but they're important um, as precursors to making those decisions. Um, and a lot of other areas of cognitive work that um, traditional psychology was basically um, had uh, sidelined in terms of un in terms of study and therefore understanding. So um, NDM sort of spawned a lot of uh, um, uh, questions around uh, how are people doing these cognitive activities, you know, effectively, sometimes skillfully, maybe with even with expertise. Um, and it's not just about choices between courses of action. There's so much more than that that we didn't we didn't really understand because because the psychology hadn't provided that so that's i mean that's really interesting because it sounds like <laughs> you've opened up a massive can of worms um and it, it it's still a really growing field um but it also sounds like it because it's the applied nature it's something that's useful it's something that people can use all the time so have you just negated all lab work, you know, or the, the whole idea of doing, of doing this lab-based experiments where everything is perfect, which doesn't really reflect real life, does it? So is that now what it's been? It changes, it changes the question, it changes the question around lab work and the, the research questions that, that make sense, I think. Hmm. Um, so, um, you know, anybody with a with a psychology background will know the term ecological validity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we talk about the validity of us of, of of our findings, um, you know, one of the elements is, you know, was the was the task that we asked people to do representative of the real world task? And so so much um, so often, particularly in in sort of experimental psychology, we've taken a very reductionist approach to that. Where you know we 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 love our box models, you know, with the arrow with a few arrows in between, but we kind of reduce things into these boxes. Yeah. And actually, what NDM has done, I think, is to sort of say. Um, and it's not just NDM. Um, before that, um, and actually, my my, pre my previous work. So I mentioned my work with John Flack, an ecological. He was an ecological psychologist looking at human factors applications. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it was really about how we 
how we pass the, the world to do our experiments, to do our lab work. So it's not that we can't do work in the lab. It's just that we think have to think about what are the phenomena that we're, what's the phenomenon that we're trying to understand and what are the variables that we are, are controlling. And actually sometimes by controlling them, we're actually completely changing the phenomenon. So for right. example, um, problem solving, um, in we, you know there's a lot of research in problem solving in the sort of 60s 70s 80s using toy problems um, problem solving in the real world is um, it arguably is planning right so you you know you've got a goal state that you want to achieve and you've got a load of resources you need to come up with a plan about how to do that um, but when you start looking at planning in the real world you realize that some of the issues so even sometimes the goal isn't clear so in the problem solving the goal is given to the participants in the study so they know what the goal is and they know what the resources are they're all there in front of them the real challenges are you don't you know the goals might change so as and as you do things the goal might change and emerge there's lots of examples of that particularly in sort of military contexts yeah. um uh even detecting that there's a problem in the first place um isn't included in the problem solving literature so so um and and uh, in ndm um we we use we've we sort of use a framework that we call macro cognition now to kind of recognize this idea that um there are the lab work and if we're looking at sort of certainly if we're looking at kind of the neurological you know factors in cognition the neuroscience neuropsychology it's very um micro and it's about processes um but NDM sort of more interested almost in the phenomenological uh, level of, of performance and so um, and so it, it does open up a whole nother can of worms we can't study you know um, uh, I can't remember what the PC version of of the current uh, you know foxes and chickens and a yeah. boat getting over the river right so the goal is very clearly stated there is a problem we know there's a problem we've got these foxes and these chickens that we need to get to the other side of the river the real world doesn't work like that you know we have all of these examples of you know in in we love talking about accidents right so three mile island Chernobyl you know a lot of those started off with actually we don't know whether there's a problem or not mm, yeah. so so and and what does psychology tell us about um, problem detection um, so macro cognition as a sort of a framework for tying some of these cognitive models or, or the, you know this the theoretical model side of things together macro cognition has uh, models of problem detection of um, uh, a planning and not just planning but replanning because we know you know no plan survives first contact so actually the interesting thing is not coming up with the initial plan it's how you adapt it and 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 how we do that and how skilled how experts or skilled people skilled planners do that because if we know how skilled planners do it then we can know how better to support those with with less experience so we can improve how we train people we can improve the technologies that we provide the decision support aids the planning tools um, but only if we understand the real work yeah and so, and the real work so just i yeah. mean and people are familiar with Steve Shorrocks. I, I love the the sort of varieties of human work and the idea of work as imagined versus work as done. NDM has always focused on understanding the work as done, but from the cognitive perspective. So that's the overlap. Right. Okay. So I guess right. So I'm a, I'm a human factor specialist. Um, how do I take this and, and 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 use it in my work? Well, what's the I guess the, the them. What's the toolbox looks like? What are the methods and tools that I can use on a day-to-day -day basis? Right. So, um, so I've been involved in so cognitive task analysis is the sort of the toolkit that we. But to cognitive task analysis, there's a, there's a lot of different uh, tools and methods. Um, some of them, you know, not that dissimilar to the classic kind of human yeah. factors tools and so forth. Um, uh, the, so, and I've done a lot of workshops on on develop, uh, training people to use the, the methods. One of the things that's important with the methods is it's actually it's not just it's not just um, it's not just the methods themselves. You have to have a little bit of an understanding of the kind of the theory and the models to, to yeah. know what you're looking for. So, for example, you could utilize um, some of the CTA methods. But if your model of how people make decisions is the rational classical decision making models, you're not going to ask good questions in your interviews. So you kind of have to have a little bit of a, an understanding of some of the models that are emerging from that NDM community. So there is a knowledge part to to this. So RPD, for example, mm -hmm. you know, if if the task is a very analytical, maybe sense making, you need to understand a little bit about the, the emerging models of sense making. Um, 
and again those models are our best our best theories our best understanding of it at the moment and they're changed they're constantly changing so there's a little bit of a knowledge piece and then the cognitive task analysis models um are about um they emerged again sort of um uh they're field research methods so so they're not uh, they're not really lab methods so it's about understanding how to go out into the field which is human factors people we've known how to do that for a long time but it's it's providing a slightly different lens so if we do observations as a human factors person and we're looking at like um difficulty importance frequency you know where people move all of those things now we're adding a, a, a lens around the cognition right what 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 decisions are, are making uh, are people making you know what are the difficult decisions why are they difficult what are the you know the situational and and uh, constraints organizational constraints um you know the challenges with the situation um and how are people making those decisions so how do experts make decisions sometimes they utilize their experience and the intuition or what you know kahneman calls the system one fast thinking side of stuff um so so it's providing that different lens um at klein associates we used a lot of interview methods mm -hmm. so and you can learn those methods the great the thing that i loved about klein associates was that um they didn't make those methods and then sudden and then tie them up and put and trademark them and they've always shared they've always shared those methods most of those methods are out in the public domain yeah. now you know you can access uh, um, interview guides for doing critical decision method which is an adaptation of what human factors people would know as critical incident technique. But, but the focus with the critical decision method is on the decision-making aspects and the probes and the, and the, the, the questions in, this, in the CDM um, interview method are geared toward, they're sort of, they're fundamentally tied to uh, an RPD model of decision-making. There's a link between RPD and, and CDM, critical decision method. Um, but um, but they provide a way to start to unpack what's what's going on in people's heads, and, and the key challenge there is the tacit knowledge. So the reason why expertise became important to the community when trying to do this was that we realised that experts it's, they find it really hard to articulate their expertise if you just say oh tell me how you did that yeah um and so the methods are designed to unpack that sort of that tacit knowledge so see so a lot of that is based in people's lived experiences and real examples rather than abstract how did you do that you say tell me about a time when your skill or expertise made a difference to the outcome so it's the framing of the interview that right. that's all informed by stuff we know about cognitive interviewing from the from the police for investigative interviewing there's ties there um so the methods um a lot of them are, are in the um sort of uh, stanton um uh baber method you know human factors methods books we we're familiar with them now yes. but we didn't have them in the early 90s and the mid you know in the 90s those sorts of methods and we're still you know they're still evolving mm. um critical decision method um, applied cognitive task analysis uh, actor which is a, a sort of three there's actually arguably four methods three for inter interviewing and one for how you sort of capture and represent the outputs of the interviews and then subsequently use them so that's the toolkit um, that as a as a human factors person we should be aware of um, they do take a little bit of skill and and learning you know yeah. like anything to do it well and they also do require a little bit of knowledge that under from what you know what underpins them to to use them most effectively that's really cool i mean there's like i said that you've you've highlighted a couple of resources there and and um and actually that importance of you can't just pick a method and 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 use it straight away you've kind of you've got to have that take the time and learn about how it's actually going to come about so if i wanted to learn more about it uh, where would you push me in the first instance? Yes, yeah, so I think that's changed in the last couple of years, really. Um, uh, the, ND, the Naturalistic Decision Making Association was formed um, only about a year ago, actually. Um, okay. I'm on the advisory board for that, but um, colleagues in the US sort of formulated that. Um, so that's for that's a, a place for for the community to congregate or people interested in cognitive work to go to and there's discussion boards and resources and so forth um the other so that's nd the ndma 
Um, and then the other resource uh, is something that I, I set up with uh, colleagues, uh, Laura Militello and Brian Moon. Um, we set up the, the Cognitive Task Analysis Institute, which at the moment, uh, that was done during COVID. At the moment, that's um, a self-study online course. Uh, there's a there's a subscription fee, yeah. um, but that's evol that's very much evolving as well. So we've kind of put the first version of what used to be face to face workshops. We've put that we've tried to put them online as a as a resource that now anybody can access. But the intent for that is that it also serves as a sort of a uh, a meeting point for people with shared interest professional interest in task analysis so that's also led to relationships um, where people have taken the methods that they've learned in the self-study course then they've gone and applied it in their work in their you know whatever their context is um, and then they can talk to other people that have done the, the course to, to find out the you know um, how the how the methods have been adapted and used in other environments um, sometimes it's led to uh, I've had a couple of sort of follow-on projects that where I've worked with with other people to um, help them uh, become a little bit more comfortable using the methods, I, I guess. Um, yeah, and you're right, you can't. Uh, you, so in the CTA Institute, the self-study course has a little bit of the background and the theory stuff, a little bit of the the methods themselves. And uh, the methods are critical decision method, um, the actor methods, which are knowledge audit and the um, simulation interview, and then some co uh, concept mapping, sort of knowledge elicitation methods, yeah. and then also some applications in training. Um, uh, simulation and aug augmented uh, reality types of training stuff um, and also uh, decision support technology design uh, you know classic human factors engineering types of stuff that's really cool that's clearly giving me a list of things that i need to do over the next few weeks and start, and start engaging with so that's really really helpful um what we're going to do now we're going to take a quick break and then we'll get into the final three questions just before barry gets to the final three my name's nick rome let me tell you about this Technology in our world is evolving at a phenomenal pace, and keeping up with what that means in the Human Factors world can be challenging. That's where Human Factors Cast comes in. Human Factors Cast is a weekly podcast that highlights and breaks down stories that are chosen by you, the Human Factors community. New York State is giving out hundreds of robots as companions for the elderly. Buttons in cars are safer and quicker to use than touchscreen. A prototype just achieved a major milestone that actually fits the description of a flying car. The show provides perspective based on experiences from different domains and different industries. We even cover some of the hottest conferences in the field. On this episode, we're recapping EHF, Ergonomics and Human Factors Conference, Neuro Ergonomics Conference, Human Factors and Ergonomics Society, uh, UXPA International. Join me, Nick Rome. And me, Barry Kirby. Every Friday morning when Human Factors Cast drops on YouTube and your favorite podcast directory. And remember, it, it depends. depends. And now I'm going to send it back over to Barry for the final three. That still makes me laugh. It's really funny. <laughs> anyway, uh, so these are the final three questions that we ask everybody. Um, and so we'll just take it off so if, do you have a book or a paper or a resource that you go back to repeatedly is, is like your uh, your bible as it were yeah um <clears throat> i think um mostly it's sort of the 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 stuff that's come out of um i mean gary klein is 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 the the sort of the pioneer of ndm and 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 the cognitive task analysis stuff i think um, there are other people that have been doing work in that area and that have contributed to that, obviously, and 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 obviously the people that that we worked with um, contributed to that. But um, <clears throat> in terms of outputs, publications, um, Gary's books are are excellent <laughs> because not only are they insightful, but they're also quite well quite well written. Uh, they're accessible, and that's the key, right? I mean, that's the challenge with human factors is making this stuff accessible. Um, and so the one probably that I go back to the, the, the book that I probably go back to the, the most is, um, the power of intuition, um, which is not the first book, but it's, it's got a few, um, the reason I go back to that is because it's got, um, some techniques for, uh, leaders and project managers. Mm -hmm. Um, and I keep going back to that because, um, that's sort of, in some ways that's the easy stuff to fix, in these 
in organizations because they're sort of training and techniques as opposed to having to go back and redesign the whole suite of you know, apps and software tools and decision supports and stuff. So people always want that. Um, and so I talk about that stuff when, when, when I, um, when I do a little bit of stuff on leadership, it's usually about the decision-making aspects. And so tools like pre-mortem um, is described in uh, Power of Intuition. Um, uh, and then other other methods around enhancing uh, training activities to focus on the decision-making aspect. So that's one of them. Um, probably the other one is Working Minds, which um, uh, Beth Crandall, who is a colleague at uh, Klein Associates, wrote with Gary and also another key kind of contributor to this area, Robert Hoffman, who, um, who was at the Institute of Human Machine uh, Cognition. IHMC in Florida for a long time, and Robert's a huge, um, or a, another huge contributor, focusing on the use of concept mapping, so a different set of techniques and, and tools. But Working Minds, um, it's, it's Working Minds, a practitioner's guide to cognitive task analysis. It's a, it's a how-to, yeah. um, and I would think that uh, if I hadn't grown, you know, if I hadn't kind of grown up in my early career doing those, using those methods with the people that develop them, that would be my go-to book. Um, and I still refer back to the, the critical decision method paper that um, Gary wrote with colleagues, um, 1989, yeah. critical decision method, um, because there's, I, I, there's always stuff that I kind of have to keep reminding myself about. So those, yeah, those are probably um, the academic books. Um, I also love Ender's Game. I did, oh, that's yeah. a that's a um so we we used to do a lot of stuff um so decision skills training uh d developing decision making as you know through training um was all about uh putting people in so it's scenario based training putting people in facing dilemmas and trying to encourage free play safe to fail kind of training activities and and then and then it's all about the sort of the debrief um which is focused on you know, what were the decisions that you had to make during that you know this scenario uh, why was it difficult you know how did you make the decisions um and but ender's game is a really good example of that um and the u.s marine corps used to, i think it used to be on one of the commander's reading lists um yes. but it's a great story uh, about a kid um being brought up to be the future of earth's military forces and his training is basically through th through uh, free play in a in a 3d gravity uh, zero gravity environment and and the learning that occurs from that um so that's a kind of a, another kind of silly little book that that, that, that's a, interesting because i've only ever seen the film and i haven't read the book yet and you're the second person this week to say no no you've got to go and read the book you do so, have to read the book yeah. the film was great because i always i always thought it'd be a great movie but the problem was always going to be how to um do the battle room which is the zero gravity yeah. how would you do that and they actually did ended up doing it quite well yeah no i i, I quite like it it's uh it's an easy <laughs> to put on um if you could go back to and choose whatever point in life suits you, but if you could go back to younger Rob uh, and have a chat, what advice would you give your younger self? Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't regret very much. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I, I feel like it would be difficult to go back and say I'd change. I'd change things. Um, I think some of the advice I'd like to give myself is just is 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 have faith in yourself. Mm -hmm um and and just and go for it don't be afraid to try things and i have tried to to live that um don't be afraid of failures or things that you that didn't turn out the way you you wanted them to or thought they would they're all learning opportunities um yeah i did a i i i i got a long way through a phd and didn't finish it but um there think there might have been some things i might have done differently there but at the time you know we talk about local rationality with the information i had at the time and the things that were going on it made sense um so um yeah i i um I, that's probably that, that's probably probably the two things don't 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 be afraid and just kind of believe in yourself go for it cool um so Fast forward a bit then, and to sort of retirement, and you decide to hang, hang up the um, the NDM coat and that type of thing. Um, what do you like to be remembered for? Uh, I think I know what I probably will be remembered for because I keep getting reminded of it. Um, I, I'm I link I'm linked to these some of these um, research databases, and they keep telling me that um, the paper that Laura Milotella wrote, and I 
co-wrote with her because we were on the project at the time uh, an applied cognitive task analysis um, that just keeps um, getting hits on it all the time and so in terms of kind of the academic literature um, yeah. that will probably live on um, but um, I guess I'm just uh, I, I hope that people remen remember me for for being an advocate for our users, particularly with respect to the cognitive aspects of performance, and trying my best to 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 understand what that means and and how to support them through that. Um, and ultimately, it's kind of about help helping people, I suppose. Um, and if it's not in the form of a you know, the result of a project that that there is a training program or a technology intervention, then at the moment I'm help, I'm hoping I'm helping some students. Um, who maybe were were like me and weren't really thinking very much or enjoying the clinical side of psychology and realizing actually there's another there is another really interesting route that um, you know you don't have to be a clinical psychologist there's a lot of of areas of applying psychology in in the business world and particularly in the engineering you know uh, engineering world um, within human factors and if I open a few eyes to that and help introduce some people um, that would be nice to to be remembered for i suppose that's fantastic and thank you rob i mean that that has the the it very much opened my eyes to the way that you can um not only you know around ndm itself and and how and how it works and some of them tools and techniques that you pointed out but also just the fact that you can have um an area of research an area of, of of development that is still growing and being able to apply it in such a meaningful way and still learn it and, and see it evolve over time i think that's been really really fascinating if people want to get in touch with you to talk more about this or to just to um pick your brains or to find out where to go more about how would they get in touch with you uh, yeah, so I have uh, LinkedIn. I, I, I'm not quite sure of the profiles. I tend to my profiles tend to be R J B Hutton. Um, yeah. So LinkedIn, I'm I'm reasonably active on LinkedIn. I've got a Twitter account that I that I maintain. Um, I can be I can be um, you can find me through UE's staff page. I've got a staff bio and my email address is on there for for my role at, at UE. Um, and also through um, the Naturalistic Decision Making Association or CTA Institute, um, if you're interested in in trying to understand a little bit more about the the methods and the community of people that are are trying to um, improve complex systems through through an, an, a better understanding of of how all this stuff can be applied, um, I'm reasonably active in in those communities as well. Um, yeah, so that's probably I, I try and make myself. I'm very happy to to talk to people about this and and to try and kind of signpost them to uh, and sometimes maybe even help them a little bit myself. That's perfect. And all of them details are available through your through the show notes um, and through the through the guest link there. So uh, feel free to go and to go and investigate that. So that wraps up this episode. Um, thank you all for watching and for for listening. Uh, tell your friends, tell your colleagues, and hopefully we shall see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to 1202, the Human, the Human Factors, Factors Podcast. Podcast. Please do get in touch with your thoughts, questions, and comments. You can contact us on social media such as Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook at 1202 Podcast. See you next See time. You next and remember, it's more than just common sense.